Yo guys, what is going on? JPS back for another video. And today we have quite the reaction. So we're gonna be reacting to the 13 hours that saved Britain. It's like a documentary. It was recommended on the video that I did about the Royal Air Force and those like bomber jets or whatever. So yeah, I mean, I'm interested in the history and stuff. You guys know I like watching this, but this, this is a long documentary, so you know, I don't know if you guys have seen it before or not, but we can both watch it for the first time or you can watch it again. Who knows? But yeah, uh, leave a like and subscribe if you're new and let's get it. I'm curious. Never heard of this before. Um, guess we'll get the context throughout the video, but here we go. On one day in September 1940, the Battle of Britain reached its decisive moment. Throughout the summer months, Britain's fighter command had fought a desperate battle against the Luftwaffe. As far as the planes were concerned, we'd never seen anything like it. It was just awesome. It was, they were overhead, there were masses of them. They'd only got to come across the water and they were here. Everybody was in the front line. The civilians were in the front line. Beneath the battle-ridden skies, people from all walks of life became involved in the defense of Britain. Age, situation or circumstance was no barrier. Yeah, I remember that. The woman. It was a time that this country was actually welded together with one aim in mind, to defeat the aggressor. Each day, they faced the grim realities of war. The next thing he said, I know I was standing on me own, he had the man's on the floor, he'd been bumped. To me, as a child, it seemed extraordinarily fun. And then I glanced to the right, and I saw this huge formation of Spitfires and Hurricanes making their way directly towards the formation of the bombers. And it was just unbelievable to see so many aircraft, never seen so many aircraft. One day of dramatic Oof. aerial combat would now decide the fate of the nation. The role of the Luftwaffe during the Battle of Britain was to destroy fighter command, to gain air superiority to enable the invasion to take place, to occupy Britain, or to force us out of the war on Nazi terms. This documentary is dramatic. This is the story of that day. Oh my gosh. The 15th of September, 1940. Crazy day, though. The 13 hours that saved Britain. Yeah, all right, I, hold on. At, at first, I was like, what day are they talking about? But there was actually a movie about this. I forgot the name of it, but it, it came out a couple years ago and it was pretty popular. So if you know what I'm talking about. In 13 hours that saved Britain. Hitler's Nazi Germany dominates Europe. His armed forces have swept across the continent, crushing all opposition. Of his enemies, only Britain remains undefeated. The rest of Europe was either enthralled to Nazi Germany or had been conquered. Poland, Denmark, Norway, France, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, these countries had fallen. So Germany was at the peak of his powers. Hermann Goering, head of the Luftwaffe, believes that attacks by German Air Force alone can bring Britain to its knees. He has promised the Fuhrer that the Royal Air Force will be swept from the skies. The German Let me Air turn Force had concentrated on the Royal Air Force, both in the air and on the ground, the fighter airfields. Germans were flying what they termed free hunts, 100, 150 uh, fighters sweeping over southern Britain, hunting out the hurricanes and spitfires. An instruction went out to our pilots not to engage these fighters unless they were escorting bombers. So the myth started to grow that the Royal Air Force was being depleted and defeated. Ah. The following events take place between 6.30 a.m. and 7.30 p.m. 13 hours that proved a turning point in the war with Germany. Oh, 
6.34 a.m. Sunday dawns for a country that has lived in fear of invasion for more than three months. We had the Germans knocking at the door. The Air Force had been overwhelmed. They would have been in London within a week or so. We couldn't have stopped it. When France fell, we didn't think we had a chance. I mean, they'd only got to come across the water, and they were here. Yeah, we were very conscious of the fact that if we lost it, I won't say the game was up, but the battle, the war would have been fought on our territory. I think to any outside observer, you'd think, well, how can that small country survive against this might? Man, this is life? so crazy. I said to this old soldier, Tell me, what are we going to do if the Germans come? He said, if the Germans come, son, you will do what you're told. Our sort of captain, mannering captain, was replaced, and he used to finish each parade. Before I dismiss you, remember, boys, take down prisoners, shoot the bastards. And your motto is, kill the Bosch! And then he'd go with his revolver, Kill, kill, kill. It encapsulates the exact attitude of the British people at that time. Britain's air defense network prepares itself for the 13 hours ahead. I'm gonna be honest, my heart is beating. Of Great Britain was divided what up the... into four fighter groups. 10 group covering the southwest, 11 group London and the southeast, 12 group, the Midlands, East Coast, and number 13 group defending parts of the Northeast Scotland and Northern Ireland. Really? Hi there, welcome to Forward. Come on in. I'm Dr. Nathan. As the day begins, one squadron from each sector is brought to readiness. The integrated air defence of the United Kingdom is all down to the foresight of Sir Hugh Dowding. When he took over fighter command, he reorganised the air defence of the United Kingdom into the group system. The Germans had nothing like it, and in fact, they just did not realise what they were up against. 8.02 a.m. A lone German Heinkel bomber on a weather reconnaissance flight flies westward along the English Channel. Out of range of British fighters, its progress is monitored by an innovation that is the cornerstone of Dowding's air defense system. We had radar, which of course gave us eyes into the continent. So we could see the buildup of aircraft and we could see the aircraft coming across uh, towards the UK. This would give us time to get the aircraft up off the ground and into position to meet any given threat. This information would go from the uh, radar stations uh, to Headquarters Fighter Command. It was filtered, passed to their operations room, and then passed direct to the group. They would place the plots on the table, and these would be tracked in by radar. CH radar was entirely in the business of defense. In other words, picking up bombers at 90 miles range before they ever started crossing the channel and heading in our direction. They were seen on the screen the moment they got up in the air. The course flown by the lone Heinkel eventually brings it within range of British fighters. Uh, the, the controller of the day would watch this. He would then alert whichever sector station he wanted the sector controller's job was to get his aircraft off the ground, to vector them towards the enemy formations. The sector controller scrambles two hurricanes from Exeter to intercept the intruder. None of its five-man crew survives. They are the first casualties of the day. For the people of Southeast England, increasingly accustomed to living in the shadow of war, it's a Sunday morning like many others. But it will not be a day of rest for many. 
put off picking his round again, and the family is sitting out on its pilgrimage to the green fields of Kent. For some children, it is the start of another day of a working holiday in the countryside, far from the dangers of war. We used to go to hot pick on the same farm every year in September. Now, it was traditional to wait for... We used to have two notifications about 10 days before we actually went, when Mum and Dad used to get a card saying, we've booked a bin and hut for you. Of course, you was agriculture workers. That, that time, 1940, you got extra rations. Summer term of 1940, attending Dartford Junior Technical College. One thing, guys. I think it's so crazy. Like, imagine being alive during that time. Like, these eyewitnesses and experiencing that. That's just... I really pray that none of us ever have to deal with war because that's that's horrible. Uh, and a notice came round Real. asking for volunteers to go fruit picking in the coming autumn. Um, apparently, um, all accommodation, food, would be provided free of charge and we'd be paid for the for the work we did. <laughs> In the East End of London, Mary Sterry is looking forward to a big family occasion. My uncle was getting married. We didn't know the girl he was getting married, but we were told that she was a young actress. We had been invited to the wedding. My father, all us kids, the one getting married, Uncle Tom, was only, um, was younger than my dad. And they didn't want us to go, did they? But, oh, we went. <laughs> Herbert Hurry is getting ready to join his workmates for a fundraising football match. I played a lot of football. And uh, in my time, I played on one or two decent grounds. But uh, uh, they, they knew that at work and that. But my foreman was a, a decent type. And uh, he said, if you clean my car, I'll let you off to play football. We used to play down by Wormwood Scrubs and uh, attract a thousand people on a Sunday. 9 a.m. While London stirs into life, at bases in occupied France, Luftwaffe air crews prepare their aircraft for a major attack. One they expect to be decisive. There was a meeting in The Hague in Holland, headed by Hermann Goering. At this meeting, the state of the Royal Air Force, in particular fighter command, was discussed. German pilots were going back, claiming maybe they'd shot down 10, 20 hurricanes and spitfires, in reality, only five. The Germans believed that the Royal Air Force was now on the verge of defeat and they mounted two major raids. 10.30am. Uh. Britain's air defences are on full alert. But now, Air Vice Marshal Keith Park, commander of... Yo, these ads are actually pissing me off. Oh my gosh. ...of 11 dude. Group receives unexpected news. Prime Minister Winston Churchill has chosen today to visit 11 Group's command centre. In full view of the controller here at Uxbridge, he could see the German forces assembling over the continent before they'd crossed the channel. Churchill watches markers appear on the table, indicating a build-up of German bomber squadrons making their way to rendezvous points over the French coast. Starting from a few aircraft coming over the, or near England, in the south and east coast, to suddenly having to put up 250 plus was very, very scary. Damn. Because you couldn't imagine that many aeroplanes coming over. And were we going to survive? 11.05. Oof. Two squadrons of Spitfires from 11 Group are scrambled from Biggin Hill. Climbing fast. They set course for their allotted patrol area 25,000 feet above Canterbury. The system swings into action as Park's controllers scramble more squadrons. Somebody would tell you that there were 200 plus, 100 plus, 50 plus coming over. A raid did build up, like a thunderstorm. 
Imagine seeing all those planes coming over in the air. I would be like, I would start running. <laughs> the Luftwaffe formations, comprising more than 200 aircraft, wheel towards England. Their target, London. Their course will take them over the farms and fields of Kent. Our neighbor said to me, your mother's calling you, Albert. So I think she wanted me to carry something back to the huts. As I walked back to the huts, we heard a heavy drone of aircraft. The weather was fine, clear skies, nice autumn days. And then, then after that, it all happened. The aircraft of Fighter Command are about to be drawn into a major battle above the Garden of England. The fate of the nation hangs upon its outcome. 11.36 a.m. Four hours in this, of five September hours. 1940. Luftwaffe formations cross the English coast at Folkestone. The only opposition they meet is anti-aircraft fire from the ground, reinforcing their belief that the Royal Air Force is on the verge of defeat and London is exposed to attack. Civilians in Kent have a ringside seat for the tumultuous events that have followed. That they weren't dropping bombs. They were just flying steadily, not speeding like they do today, just steadily, masses of them, flying inland. Sitting alone in his garden, Graham Matthews watches almost 200 enemy aircraft cross the skies of Kent. I was in this garden. In fact, I was sitting on the steps right behind me here. Uh, when I heard the German bombers coming over uh, and I could see this column of German planes. <laughs> they were flying into these big puffs of uh, uh, flak put up by the uh, anti-aircraft guns. I'm telling you, if Once I saw that... ...aircraft had crossed the coastline, radar was technically redundant. So it was the observer call, simply by looking through a rangefinder, binoculars, identified the aircraft, height, direction and number, feeding that information back to an observer centre and from that centre simultaneously to the command, sector and to group. Having got your plots, it was then up to the controller to say what he wanted done with them. When there was a battle on, you would plot your plots and you could see the combat coming, coming nearer and nearer. Precise information on the raiders' progress is relayed to RAF fighter squadrons. the sirens or anti-aircraft guns, you must get under cover at once. You must not stand staring up at the sky. The siren went and of course as a six-year-old I thought this is it, war, war. <laughs> so I zoomed out to the uh, front door and stood there waiting to see all the soldiers with their guns and firing <laughs> and shooting and sword fighting and all that. <gasps> Nothing. Most people went to the underground or if they, they had the little Anson sort of shelter in the tins placed in, in the bottom of the garden. My next door neighbour, he'd dug a hole underneath his garage. If I was at home, I'd go down there and shelter. Above Canterbury, patrolling Spitfires of 92 and 72 <coughs> squadrons have spotted the enemy formations and dive in to attack. Along with other children, Ray Binks has been sent from London to the safety of rural Kent. But he soon discovered that the front line of the aerial battle now runs through the fields and villages of southern England. We were watching all these air battles going on, and all of a sudden, from across the trees, was this German bomber came across so low that you felt you needed to duck. And behind it was one of our fighter aircraft, and they were both having to go at each other. And the engagement initially only lasted a couple of seconds. And then you would then break away and then attack them individually again until either you were out of ammunition or for one reason or another you weren't able to attack anything. More British fighter squadrons join the action. 
our boys were coming out of the sky and uh, shooting them up and they were going up and there was these vapor trails you had vapor trails all over the sky um, it was just like a lace work pattern so you'd hear the roar of the engines and the stutter of the the guns and uh, screaming well screaming of the engines really you would see the smoke start pouring out of one and then it was plummets to the ground drawing nearer to london the beleaguered german formations reached the village of chislehurst my father had heard that chislehurst caves was a place where people used to go who were bombed out so he said let's get into the van and we go to the caves there was hardly any light in at all they gave us the hurricane lamps to find our way in. They gave us mattresses to lay on, on the floor, blankets. And we were one of the early ones then because that was just at the start of it. And there was very few people here. There was no, uh, no sound of uh, wow. aircraft or bombs or guns. But Ron has no intention of missing the excitement taking place overhead. <laughs> he leaves the shelter of the caves. I was more Bad interested move. in watching what was going on <sighs> and I saw this huge formation of spitfires and hurricanes, more than I'd seen before, I should say roughly again about 50 or 60 of them, making their way directly towards the formation of the bombers. Uh, matter of fact guys, I have a quick thing to say. I don't think I've ever told like really anyone this, but I'm part I have a lot of like European descent. I'm part Irish, part German, part Russian, and a bunch of other stuff. But my grandmother's Russian. I mean, oh my gosh, my grandmother's German, and like her her parents and them they got out like right before all this happened. Like it was just my dad told me about it. It's just crazy. So I'm not saying I have like a personal connection to this or anything, but these like you know eyewitness stories are crazy. I like how it's going like from right when they reach the coast all the way up until, you know, their goal of getting to London, the Germans uh, bombers. But yeah, this is, my heart rate is up. Is anyone else's heart rate up watching this? I'm Twelve scared. scared. <laughs> Hard pressed and stripped of most of their fighter escort, the German bomber formations arrive over London. You could hear the, um, the throbbing of these uh, aircraft. That was, it was pretty eerie, I must say. You could hear, dro it was droning, you know, sort of, and you think, oh my gosh, we're going to be in for it. <laughs> Twin brothers Jeffrey and Alan Lee Williams are already accomplished plane spotters. We knew all the aircraft before we joined the ATC, because every book we bought was about aircraft recognition. German bombers, especially the Hankels, they made a very distinctive noise. So you could tell the difference between a German plane and a, and a British plane. 12.08 p.m. Park has six fighter squadrons over the capital itself, with six more en route from neighboring groups. More than 125 RAF fighters are about to fall on the Luftwaffe formations. Once the fighters were up there, there was no anti-aircraft fighting. They, they, you know, the, you know, otherwise our, our, our aircraft would have been vulnerable. Clear blue sky above us. The bombers were about 15 to 20,000 feet up, I think. And the fighters were above them, beneath them. And the fighters were attacking each other. The hurricanes were attacking the bombers, as far as we could de detect. And the Spitfires were attacking the Messerschmitts. There was this chap that I attacked, and I remember being very close to it, and I remember also uh, it splattering bits and pieces. It's rather like hitting water with the back of a spoon, you know, you see things fly off in all directions. I wonder where they got that footage. Five squadrons from 12 Group now into the fray. 
There were that many RAF fighters in the sky, <laughs> technically they were getting in each other's way. Jeez. You got yourself tangled up with these things with black swastikas and crosses on them and things. Occasionally, you would find you were mixed up in a dogfight and a spitfire would whiz past and you'd think, ah, there's somebody else here as well, a friend. But uh, otherwise you didn't see them. You lost contact with all your own aircraft after all. One minute the sky was a tangled mass of whirling aircraft and you fastened on to one and went off in one direction. And by the time you'd finished with that, you looked around, there was nobody to be seen anywhere. Looking up, I, didn't, I couldn't tell which was which. I mean, to me, they looked like giant moths playing your it. But I couldn't <laughs> tell which was ours and which was theirs. The German airman, as he crossed over, a risky believing job. that the Royal Air Force was defeated, to be confronted by another 50 to 60 hurricanes and spitfires, you can imagine how their morale felt. A lot of the bombers, once they got to London, they quickly turned round, and as they flew back, they got rid of the bombs. Oh. I don't remember hearing a noise at all. I think the bomb was so close that, that we didn't hear the noise, but we felt the blast. And we were picked up and thrown into the wool shop. And, of course, the blast had reached the window and blown it in before it blew us through the, you, a, a fraction of a fraction of a second between the two events, thank God, because if we'd actually gone through the glass, I think it might well have killed us. And then, as I was about to deliver a, another attack on the same aeroplanes, um, the crew began to bail out. And I was immediately behind it, and I remember seeing things I didn't really recognize to start with until they were flew past the top of my cockpit, and I realized they were arms and legs. The German aircraft was shot down just over um, our area. Oh, and the, the, the pilot parachuted into the grounds of the old Bedlam Lunatic Asylum, which is now the Imperial War Museum. Uh, he was immediately surrounded by as many people as you can name. Um, all very, very angry, of course. 12.11 p.m. The German formations turn away from London and head back towards the English Channel, harried all the way by Spitfires and Hurricanes. Two of the bomber pilots decided it was time to go home. They didn't fancy, they'd never seen so many Spitfires and Hurricanes together in one time. So they took a turn. They broke off from the right side of the uh, formation, which brought the two of them towards me. As they were coming over, they thought they'd get a bit more speed, so they started to jettison their bombs. One of the bombs came down quite near me, but being young and energetic and quite fit, I was able to run. I felt the blast of the bomb, but I ran I managed to keep my feet and ran into the caves. That bomb. Well, when the German Damn. formation started its retreat from London, uh, RAF fighters were concentrating on trying to bring the aircraft down. The German commander uh, of that formation, Alois Lindmayer, kept his formation together as tightly as possible, knowing that if it was split up, uh, individual uh, aircraft would be doomed. <laughs> and he beat uh, a brilliant tactical retreat. He managed to get most of his formation back across the channel. Twelve fifty-five p.m. Mm. All clear sounds over London and the southeast. When we came out, we saw that our house and business, which was a future and green grocers, belonging to our father, was completely ruined. Wow. Everything was smashed to smithereens, and nothing left at all. I had a friend at school, and, and we decided that we'd meet up at the weekend, and I would cycle over to his house. But when I got to the cottage, the there was just bunny. a heap of rubble. There was no the house gone. I leapt up and opened my window, and sure enough, 
There in the gutter was a big, plump chicken. I shouted to my little tiny brother at the time, we're going to have chicken tonight. <laughs> it turned out that um, what our dead chicken was, was that there was a very plump lady who was in the houses down the road and uh, it, uh, it was that much of a, her arm that had got blown and, and onto our roof. That oh. was suddenly um, My. a little boy growing up very quickly and thinking war is not much fun. They asked me to carry mugs of tea to the firemen who were still fighting the flames, the ambulance people who were still dealing with people who were trapped in some of the burnt buildings. We stayed there, I think, till most of the day until the fires had all calmed down. But it was an experience that's impinged on my mind to such an extent. It'll never go away. 1 p.m. In the operations room of 11 Group, the plotting map is cleared of enemy markers. The Luftwaffe attack has been heavily disrupted. They have lost 18 aircraft, the RAF 13. But more hard fighting lies ahead. The Luftwaffe is gathering its forces for a second, far greater assault that will push fighter command to the very limit. <sighs> 1 5 p.m., 15th of September, 1940. German bombing raids have shattered the peace of Sunday morning. The people of London and South East England begin dealing with the aftermath of the raid. Some discover more than just debris and destruction. We were in our shelter and we crept hmm? out and in the first apple tree down the garden there was a parachute opened. No sign of, a, of an airman, just the parachute. This little pickup truck came along, I think it was a Hillman or an Austin, um, with four or five home guard in the back uh, and I think they had one rifle uh, and they asked us where they where the parachutes had come down and uh, so we told them and off they went we were told to keep them covered and make them take off their parachute when they were captured those German pilots they were so arrogant they couldn't do anything with them because they thought they would be uh, released in a few weeks, the Brits were going to give in. I think oh. if someone's dropping bombs on you, you don't like those people very much. You know, the, the um, there used to be a saying going around the only good German was a dead German. Oh. I want to say that's how I would feel. Uh, that's how I would feel if I were in their shoes. But, guys, um, like, I need you guys to comment down below. Have any of you, like, do any of you have personal experiences or your parents with this, like, these 13 hours? Uh, comment down below. I'm actually really curious about that, but, yeah. It should lightened it up for us Tell kids. <sighs> the other thing was, which lightened it up for us kids, was searching for shrapnel. Shrapnel became a sort of currency amongst small boys. You could swap cigarette cards for shrapnel the other way around. What is it? No, really shrapnel? Good conquer would be worth a piece of shrapnel. Uh, and so getting out into the streets first was quite important. What you got, Gert? Good. Cool. That'll make a good souvenir. There would be competition between other boys, mostly boys, girls as well, I suppose, but mostly boys, yeah. of how much um, you collected. Oh, like we collected buckets mm. of, of, of the stuff. OK, I got it. We did find uh, a live incendiary bomb. So I took it along to my friend's house, who lives a bit further this way, and um, he got it on the workbench, and he's drilling a hole in it, and of course they're magnesium, and the drill bit was getting hot, and it was this vivid blue or mauve flame coming off the uh, bomb, and, and I decided to get out of it as quickly as possible, and I went and told his mum, and he was rather upset about that, you know. <laughs> stop him, stop his fun. <laughs> as soon as the... Uh people had cleared the bomb site. We were on it. What we were mainly looking for were pennies that, you know, might have got buried in uh, somebody, a little hoard of things. Um, wasn't very nice, really, when you come to think of it. But then, of course, it, uh, there was yeah. the sort of lightness for us as children 
little bit of adventure, but uh, after all the horrors. Wow. 1.40 p.m. Reports are streaming in as the electronic eyes of the radar network detect another build-up of enemy aircraft oh, across the no. channel. Oh, no. Stop it. In the afternoon, radar picked up an even larger formation forming up and crossing over the channel. Although it couldn't give an exact number, it was estimated to be 400 plus aircraft. Our aircraft, of course, after the morning raid, had returned to uh, ground to rearm and refuel, and were back up in the sky to meet this threat. The Luftwaffe forms three huge columns of aircraft. This aerial armada is determined to batter its way through all opposition. We didn't really know what to expect. Well, we were all praying that um, we were, the, the Air Force was going to be strong enough to hold out. You adopt a sort of fatalistic attitude to it. You just carry on as best you can. There was a phrase during the war which saying is that if a bomb has got your name on it, that's the one to worry about. <laughs> But at my age, yeah, honestly. you couldn't be killed anyway, could you? It, it, was, um, yeah. it was a big adventure. That's how all 45 feel. Here. A lone Spitfire is ordered high over the English Channel to wait for the incoming air fleets and relay visual reports to ground controllers. Meanwhile, Mary is under the impression that her memorable Sunday is over. Yeah. She had a white wedding dress. Not and quite. She some flowers, just little tiny flowers in her hair, you know. Anyway, once she'd, they'd got married, they came out of the church, right? Got in their car and disappeared. My father said, come on, let's go home then. We'd never known anything like this before. And uh, the only consolation we had was that everyone was in the same boat. Yeah, yes. Imagine getting married and then bombed. What the heck? Not the ideal wedding day. 26,000 feet above the English coast, the lone forward patrolling Spitfire spots the incoming German formations. Five minutes later, more than 450 enemy aircraft begin to cross the English coast. As each of his squadrons returns to combat readiness, Air Vice Marshal Keith Park orders them airborne once more. And again, he requests help from neighboring groups. OK. OK, Chuck, scramble. 2 or 5 p.m. 275 fighters are scrambled to face more than 100 bombers escorted by over 350 enemy fighters. Throughout southeast England, the air raid sirens scream their warning. This is Red Observer. We got hostiles, 30 plus. They herald the approach of the enemy air fleet and a battle fast moving towards its climax. <laughs> 2 14 pm. The first clashes take place high above Romney Marsh as three Spitfire squadrons throw themselves. Come Jesse on, has man. all the best flavors to help you crush you your put this right when the climax is coming. <laughs> Here we go. A steep dive to attack the enemy for My heart is beating, dude. Uh, I saw all these hundreds of Germans coming in, and uh, we went in as a squadron to attack the bombers. So. I went in at this height, they were in close formation, and the gunner never fired back at me, and I, I always thought that somebody had been at him first. But anyway, I, I got an engine blazing. So the Spitfires had come down to uh, see to them, and the 109s would come down to attack the Spitfires. So by the time we got off the end of a squirting at a whole line of bombers, uh, all hell was let loose. Speed and surprise drives them through the escorting fighters and onto the bombers. Had a quick poke at a bomber, then been bounced by the 109 escort yourself, 
So you would have to concentrate on saving yourself from the 109s. German fighters are hampered by orders to stick close to the bomber formations and struggle to beat off the initial attacks. I was cycling along when I saw this aircraft coming toward me, very, very low, rooftop height. I jumped off my bicycle and quickly ran into the station and then realised the station wasn't a safe place to be because that could obviously be a target. Yeah. The German formations battle through to the outskirts of London. Oh, we no. went into the Anderson shelter, and then people started to say, look at this. And of course, we all piled out to see what this was. And it was just unbelievable to see so many aircraft, never seen so many aircraft. 2.30 PM. The first of London's anti-aircraft batteries opened fire. With little more than 200 heavy guns available, London is desperately short of anti-aircraft artillery. Yeah, that's not enough. The enemy. barrage unsettles the approaching bombers and acts as a beacon for British fighters. The first thing we'd see is the cloud of anti-aircraft fire. We seldom saw aircraft in the air because you could pass 500 aeroplanes flying in the opposite direction two miles away and not see a thing. All we used to see were the anti-aircraft shells bursting and we would fly towards them, and then in the middle of those, of course, would be the bombers. In fact, we used to say that the only useful thing that the anti-aircraft did was to provide the puffs in the air which enabled us to see the bombers. <laughs> My chub came in, all his clothes had little holes in I it. I like this guy. shrapnel from the big guns uh, from the, the parks, you know, and they all the shrapnel had gone through him, burnt, burnt holes all over his suit. Damn. Stretching out over town and countryside, 60 miles back to the English coastline, the sky is dotted with twisting, turning aircraft and streaks of vapor and smoke. What you can remember is the, the coming down in smoke and screaming and that sort of thing, uh, sparring down with a, a column of smoke and hitting the, hit them when they hit the ground. 2.33 p.m. The command system is becoming overloaded with reports of squadrons engaging and dogfights underway. The situation boards and the plotter's activity tell a story of total commitment. One would have the impression that during a battle, the operations room would be calm, controlled, and orderly. According to one of the ladies that worked here, when aircraft were up, it was chaotic and extremely noisy. Churchill observes the crowded plotting table, sensing that the action is approaching a climax. Here we go. He looks for signs of squadrons being held in reserve. He asked Park, how many reserves do we have left? The answer was none. Everything was committed for the afternoon raid. Park, later described as a man who could have lost the war in an afternoon, has sent every available squadron into action. The decisive hour has arrived. Uh -oh. Two forty-five p.m. 15th of September 1940. The battle rages over southeast England. Every available RAF fighter squadron is airborne and committed. British pilots are pushing themselves to the very limit. But inevitably, bombs begin to fall on the capital. By the time they arrived over the city, London was covered in cloud. They could not see their target, so they just threw their bombs out indiscriminately. All of a sudden, there was this tremendous thump, and the house shook. And I heard a bomb drop quite close. Oh, my God. And then gosh. another one, much closer. And I remember thinking to myself, I hope there's not a third. But there was. All the lights went out. It was pitch dark. All the dirt and dust came up from the floor. Everyone was choking. But fortunately, we were alive. Right next door to us was the pickle factory. <laughs> well, that got hit. The pickles going. And there was pickles flying. I already everywhere. knew. They were 
bottles bursting and oh, everywhere because everywhere I owned the bikes, you know, there was pickles flying everywhere. <gasps> Yo, imagine, and, listen, imagine you're like literally scared to death, rightfully so, <laughs> and then <laughs> pickles just start flying. And then pickles smack you in the face. <laughs> oh my god. Dropped, and they dropped with a hell of a bang. And windows got blown in, and roofs got blown off. And very strange things happened to houses. And pickles. Get sliced right through, and there'd be a gap. And you'd see all the wallpaper of all the rooms of that house that was still standing. But these were the ghosts of the house that had gone yeah exactly that's i remember crazy. coming out of the church and realizing that we was being bombed oh my dad <laughs> said undercover undercover there were so many bombs falling then and they were falling down believe me because <laughs> the bombs was falling down we was running here there and everywhere trying to get out of the way we went into the shelter except my brother wanted to go home with his wife and the baby the bomb came down at the front of the shelter and pushed him down on top of his wife and the baby so they were saved but he was gone wow and that was the last time i see him rest in peace wow during the war people got killed but you never looked at it from that point of view i suppose the fighter pilots were the same really they just glad to they shot someone down it was either them or us honestly <laughs> Bombs have been scattered over a wide area of southeast London. Now, the raiders turn for home. Their escort fighters have already left with barely enough fuel for the return flight. And then there were sitting ducks, and that's why there were so many German bombers shot down. 3.15 p.m. As the retreating bombers reach the channel, they are met by fresh German fighters hastily dispatched from bases in France. Fresh British fighters, racing towards the battle from bases in Exeter, engage them. But British fighters are forced to abandon the chase. They are low on fuel and ammunition, and forbidden to pursue the enemy out across the sea. ominous clouds piling in the skies, the threat of further aerial action recedes, much to the relief of all who have fought and lived through this day. 5.25 p.m. One last Luftwaffe daylight raid is plotted. In spite of a grueling day's fighting, several RAF squadrons again take to the air. The enemy raiders are a fast hit-and-run force of fighter bombers, targeting the Spitfire works at Southampton. But they are driven off without loss to either side. Good. For fighter command, it is their last major action of the day. Today was the most costly for the German Air Force for nearly a month. In daylight raids, between 350 and 400 enemy aircraft were launched in two attacks against London and Southeast England. About half of them were shot down. In the heat of battle, RAF pilots believe they've shot down many more aircraft than they have. Actual German losses are more down to earth. The Luftwaffe has lost 79 aircraft and more than 130 aircrew compared to RAF losses of 29 aircraft with 12 pilots killed. Nonetheless, it represents a stunning victory. Yeah. It was a defining <clears throat> point in the war. Two days later, Hitler postponed Operation Sea Lion. He realized that the Luftwaffe had not defeated the Royal Air Force, therefore the invasion could not go ahead. And you felt so proud of these wonderful young men who was defending us yes i mean you um they were in that sense heroes to us these were people giving their lives and protecting us and if i could have uh, you know learned how to fly an airplane i'd have been up there 
I wouldn't, of course. My mother wouldn't let me. <laughs> yeah. The, the 15th of September 1940 was the finest hour in our history because we came so near to, to defeat. It was a time when Hitler thought he would be able to bring us to our knees and he failed. It was just, you know, a remarkable outcome and here we are to tell the story. Yeah. And when we were at an air raid sh shelter, <clears throat> when an RAF pilot came in, and people stood up. Yes. Oh, yes. And applauded him. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he was only a young chap, very yeah. No medals. Yeah. He, but he had his, you know, wings. They said. He was waiting, yeah. I think, to, to do great things. But he would look so young. But everyone stood up in that shelter, mm -hmm. and the, rather like a theater performance, they applauded him. <laughs> the fighter squadrons a highly organized defense system, and the national spirit of resilience have taught the Nazi regime an abrupt lesson. It Don't is mess their with first Britain. military defeat. There will be bombing raids on British cities under the cover of night. There will be four more years of hard fighting. But Britain itself has been saved. The British people have maintained Don't their freedom Britain, no. and secured their island home from invasion. What the heck? What the heck? Bro, that was crazy. Like, I was just not expecting any of that. Um, <laughs> someone is using the sink. Also, guys, I want to say something real quick. I apologize if there's any background noise. Uh, obviously, I don't live alone yet. I can't wait to. That, that's going to be amazing. Anyways, I am just, just want to get that out of the way. But, um... Yeah, that's <laughs> that was like um, people who lived through that, lived to tell the story, the witnesses, just crazy stuff. You know what I mean? Imagine, like I said it before, but like imagine it's just a normal Sunday, you wake up and then you get note like that you're getting notice that you're getting bombed. Like what? That's crazy. But um, yeah, I'm definitely glad we watched that. I feel like that's definitely one of the more important parts of British history because. If you know, if it didn't turn out that way, I don't know if there would be any more British history after, you know, that Sunday. But anyways, uh, make sure y'all leave a like, hit the subscribe button, um, and comment some stuff you guys would like me to check out down below. Any more history stuff. Um, yeah, sh uh, rest in peace to everyone who died. You know what I mean? Rest in peace. And I'm sorry if any of you guys had to experience that stuff or your family members because that, that sucks. Or if you lost any family members. But, yeah. Uh, that's, that's about all for now. That was a really good documentary. And, yeah, I'm going to catch you guys in the next video. Peace.